Amen. Worship the Lord on high, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. We thank you, Lord, that you have not forsaken us, even if we feel forsaken. Thank you that you have not abandoned us, even if we feel abandoned, and we pray that we would never forsake and abandon you. Those who are joining us in live, watching us uh, online, as well as those who are here live in person, we are um, just two quick announcements. Uh, the sermon series has been uploaded on our YouTube channel, and for those who are not able to get on Facebook, you can literally go to the site, 1C22, the sermon links uh, to the YouTube links to the YouTube channel is on the site, so you don't have to run through YouTube and try and figure out which Jason Porter it is, or try and figure out, all you got to do is go to the site, hit the link, and it'll take you to all of the video sermon series. Uh, as usual, the sermon PDF notes are also online as well, and uh, be patient with us as we make other changes to the website. However, we're about to get into this word tonight. Um, these last two sermons of 2023 are the summation of everything that this sermon series um, has been going towards, the purpose, the reason of everything that has been uh, laid out, cut up, uh, executed in this last year is coming to a head and is going to have its full fulfillment in these final two sermons. So I will ask you, if you are um, watching online and you just kind of picked a random sermon uh, and you didn't know that it was connected to an entire sermon series, um, I would advise you to please remember these last two sermons to connect all these dots together. Those who have been faithful to hear the word of the Lord and really, really fight for your mind. Those who have been faithful to really, really fight for your mind, I have begged God, I've prayed, I've fasted, I've sought, and his word is powerful, his word is real, and I promise you, if you take his word seriously, he will renew your mind. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 15 and 16, uh, <clears throat> as it said, he that is spiritual judges everything, but he himself is judged by no man. Verse 16, for who has understood the mind of the Lord, so as to instruct them, we have the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. Everybody repeat after me in Yeshua's name. I have an anointed mind. Hallelujah. I act like God because I think like God. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that that prophetic fulfillment would be fulfilled in us tonight, that we would think like you, we would act like you, because we'd have your mind. So finish the good work that you started in us, in Yeshua's name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So, what is this really all about? When we talk about the mind of Christ, when we talk about acting like Christ, what is the root? We've looked at this issue of pride. We've looked at Cain. We've looked at, at Saul. We've looked at a, a Samuel psyche. We've gone through people that have certain mindsets in Scripture. We've challenged our own hearts. We've looked at how, first, uh, how in James it says that a double-minded man or a double soul, a double soul is unstable in all their ways. The purpose is to arm you with the biblical tools to fight for your mind, but understand that it is God's will for you to think like him and act like, like him. I said it's God's what? Will. This whole series has been about God's will. So every time we've been reading a verse in Scripture, I have known from the beginning that this is where God was going to end up. And Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. However, last week, it says testing so you can discern. Passing the test. Passing the test in this season, in this area of your mind is connected to discerning the good, acceptable, and perfect will 
of God. This whole fight for your mind, this whole fight for your soul, your body, and your spirit, you can't act like God if you don't think like God, but you can't act or think like God if you are not willing to act and think like God. Nothing that I preached in this last year matters if you don't understand this simple but ignored, overlooked, and mocked concept in the Bible. Note 1B. So as we looked at this testing, and we've gone back and forth with Cain and Abel, and Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, note 1B, by faith, Abel offered to God a better or more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, though being dead, it or he still speaks. Hold on. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Present your what? Your bodies. This whole issue between Cain and Abel, both of them offered sacrifices. One was according to the will of God, one was not. So, because Cain's sacrifice was according to the will of God, God called, excuse me, Abel's sacrifice was according to the will of God. God called Abel's sacrifice better. Better. How do we connect this dot with Cain and Saul? Because what does Samuel tell Saul? And note one sees, 1 Samuel 15, 22. Samuel said, does Yahweh have great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying Yahweh's voice? Behold, obedience is better than sacrifice. And to listen, listening is better than the fat of ram. You present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Why? So that you may discern the perfect will of God. What is good, what is acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Cain did not offer an obedient sacrifice. Therefore, his sacrifice was rejected. The same way Saul walked in disobedience. That's why he was rejected. First title of the night sermon. Can I get a willing witness? Can I get a willing witness? What he told him, and in, in what, what, what the writer tells us in Hebrews 11, that, that Cain's gift was, it was testifying. You see that? Or excuse me, Abel's gift was testifying. I've been talking about Cain so much, I forgot. We're on, we're on to the right guy. Abel. Note 1D. Whether or not you are willing to listen to Yahweh Jesus is judged by the testimony of your obedience. Here, look at this in Psalms 40. This is note 2a. And sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted, but you have opened my ears. Obedience is better than sacrifice and listening. That is what is more important. He says in Psalms 40, and sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted, but you have opened my ears for me. Burnt offering and sin offering, you have not required. Verse 8, I delight to do your will. Your law, your Torah is in my heart. I delight to do your will. Now in Hebrews chapter 10, quoting this verse, quoting in this verse, right? Present your what as a living sacrifice? Your body. And Hebrews 10 verse 5, when Christ came into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, we're quoting this, but a body you have prepared for me. Then I said, behold, I've come to do your will. Now check this out in 1 Corinthians 10. Note 
Note 2C says, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from that spiritual rock, and the rock was Christ. Christ means anointed. You have an anointed mind, a Christ conscious. I want you to partake tonight in these messianic meals. That's what the Messiah means, messianic, anointed Christ. Note 2D, willing minds who want their bodies to be filled with Yeshua's anointing. Oh, I want to be filled. Just fill with your glory. Hold on. That means you need to open your ears to listen to Yahweh Jesus and open your mouth to digest his word. So this is why prayer is one of the most spiritually offensive things to your flesh and to the kingdom of darkness. Because if you're praying it right, Jesus shows you how to pray. And he says, pray like this, our Father in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. That means there's something today, not yesterday, not tomorrow. There's something today that God has for you. But you have to be willing to digest it. What is that? John 4, 34. My food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. I delight to do your will. Do you? What about when it's something you don't want to do? For example, what people miss about the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was challenged to do something he did not want to do. Luke 22, Matthew 26, both refer to this prayer. He knelt down, prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying, I do not want to do this. Every single one of us has been challenged with doing something that we don't want to do. But then, he prays what is the most important prayer you will ever pray. When confronted with something you don't want to do. Nevertheless, not, not, not my will, but yours be done. The idea of doing God's will is a thought. The idea of not doing God's will is a thought. Third title. They all, they all kill it tonight, so I had to get them all. Food for thought. Note 3D. The appetite of those who think like Yeshua. Feed on doing Yahweh's will. That is the difference between those who want to do Yahweh's will and those who do not. Before we talk about right and wrong, what I am constantly doing with people, even though I've still, for some reason, get accused of forcing my will or my opinion on people, the first question I ask them in these counseling situations is, tell me, 
what do you want? Because if you really don't want the truth, then you will be wasting my time and Yahweh's time. If you really don't want to do the right thing, then you're wasting my time and Yahweh's time. So let's just start, first and foremost, what do you want? Don't tell me that I'm forcing my opinion upon you. Don't tell me that I'm making you do something you don't want to do, because the first thing I want to know is, I want to know whether or not you want to do Yahweh's will, because I will never agree with anything that is in opposition to Yahweh's will. That's why this is as old as the garden. No, the issue was not about fruit. It could have been a lollipop. It could have been a donut. Didn't matter what it was that God said don't eat. It's the fact that he said don't. It's what it's always been about. Those who want to do what God said and those who do not. Note 4a, when the woman saw the tree was good for food, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. She saw it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes and desirable. Desirable to make one wife. Then she ate of its fruit and gave to her husband with her and he ate. See, I am not challenging you, judging you, or even condemning you for your desires. Well, you know, Jace, I'm struggling with this. I want to do that. Okay, yeah, we, we, that, that's why we're in a fallen world. I'm sure everyone's got something. That is not what God, God is not impressed with your carnal appetite. He's impressed with what you do with it. So just because you have desire or, or have urge, welcome to the human experience. That is not why one is condemned or justified. Quit deifying your desires. So, of course, it was desirable to make one wise. Sure. It was pleasant. Good for food. That was not the issue. Did God say yes or no? Do you want to do what God said, yes or no? So, the world... Those who are not believers, this is not for you. But if you are calling yourself a believer in Jesus the Messiah, who led by the example, who said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done, then you are called to follow in his example. As Galatians chapter 5, verse 24 says in note 4b, those who belong to Christ have no passions or desires. Is that what he said? Those who belong to Christ are never tempted, never have urges. That's not what he said. It's about what do you do with those urges? Those who belong to Christ have crucified, crucified, crucified the flesh with their passions and desires. Give me this day my daily bread. So if you really want to take off this Cowardly manifestation of false humility. Oh, I'm just a, just a sinner and I have all these earth. Well, like all of us, that's not the question. True humility submits to the will of God. So when he says obedience is better than sacrifice, okay, well, what am I supposed to do to obey? The sacrifices of God are broken spirit, a broken and contrite, humble heart God will not despise. That's what he's telling you. Let's break bread tonight. Fourth title, 
breaking bread, broken. When you decide that your will and what you want is more important than Yahweh Jesus, you are not broken. You are not humble. You are not contrite. It is that simple. It's not about trauma. It's not about your family. It's not about what happened to you. No, 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 no. What God said, he knows what happened to you. He knows. And still, just like Jesus now, who was betrayed, spit upon, rebuked, mocked, and still had an opportunity to say no. But he said, I understand this is going to be painful. I understand this is going to be embarrassing. I understand, and no one watching or in this room has ever been more embarrassed than Jesus of Nazareth. No one has ever suffered more than Jesus of Nazareth. No one has ever been more discouraged, more disappointed, again, and was completely innocent. Note 4D, the broken humble themselves by fasting from their own desires to do Yahweh's will. Well, you know, I went on this fast, and I didn't eat this food. But for some reason, when it comes to those other things, those urges that God was telling you to be obedient and reject, all of a sudden, you weren't fasting. So you can fast this. You can stop doing that. But when it's something you actually still want to do, all of a sudden, you have a problem fasting from it because it's not an ability issue. It is your will. The broken humble themselves by fasting from their own desires to do Yahweh's will. The prideful break their fast to do their own will. No, we try to make it all complicated, super deep and theological. Oh, let's get clinical. Oh, let's talk about psychology. 99% of the problems that people are dealing with it's not an ability problem. It is a will problem. Note 5a, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Those who belong to Christ have what? Crucified the flesh with the passion of God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It's not me. Christ who lives. I'm here to prophesy to you tonight. Christ lives. Messiah Jesus lives. And you have the choice about whether or not he lives in you and through you. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you understand? When we talk about the love of God, look how loving God is and look how kind God is. Look about, it is connected to you being crucified with him. The pagan eros love that is baptized as culture has given you a love that has taken away the crucifixion of your flesh. Give me this day my daily bread. What does that mean? 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. That means you wake up every day and you have a choice. Am I going to live for me or am I going to live for him who died for me? That's a will issue. This is fundamental to the gospel. Don't tell me that I preach a cultish gospel. I'm simply quoting what Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 16, repeated in Luke 9, 23, Jesus told his disciples, not people who call themselves Christians and still mock his name with unrepented sin. People are disciples, students of the master. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone wants to follow me, let him, uh-oh, deny himself. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with the passions and the desires. It's not a problem that you have passions and desires. It's a problem if you're not crucifying them. Thank God that he gives you an opportunity to be like Jesus. Not when you do everything that you want to do, but when you deny your flesh and then do what you don't want to do. 
Jesus told his disciples, if anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to say this is the best verse for people with control issues. The illusion of control. Whoever wants to save his life, control his life, keep his life, find his life, will lose it. That's a will issue. But whoever loses his life, loses control and gives it to the master, surrenders his will to Yahweh Jesus, will find it. And every lost person on this planet, every person that doesn't know Jesus and the people who say they do, but they're still lost in their sin and iniquity, it is because you have refused to give Yahweh Jesus control. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's what it means to be a disciple. Fifth title. There is a wicked, wicked man who we will be talking about in this next series. And he coined the phrase, do what thou wilt. The law of the lima. Why? Because the Greek word for will is thelema. But the gospel is about denying yourself. Do what thou won't. Note 5D, living faith. I'm crucified with Christ Jesus. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Messiah Jesus lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith because disobedience, refusing to not do God's will, is an issue of unbelief. You don't believe that God's will is better than yours. Living faith daily submits to the execution of your will in exchange for the will of Yahweh Jesus. No one needs to be condemned tonight about having desires or urges. No, no, no. But you do need to be convicted about what you did with those desires and those urges. In Luke 4, stories repeated in Matthew. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, being led by the Spirit in the wilderness. being tested for 40 days. See, this is why we was, that's why you are set up last week with this whole presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice and this issue of testing. Jesus, tested for 40 days by the devil. He ate nothing those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Hmm. When they were ended, First thing you need to notice. The enemy comes to test Jesus after he already passed the test. This is why you cannot let the demonic assassin of pride ever enter. Because what happens is he that thinks he stands, take heed lest he falls. He was hungry after those 40 days were ended. Note 6b, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. My food is to do the will of God and to finish his work. My food is to do the will of God. And to finish his work. It is written, man should not live by bread alone. But I want to make sure we look at this verse in context. 
of what he literally said. See, in Deuteronomy chapter 8 is where this verse he's quoting, because remember Jesus said, it is written. Now, you read in your English translation, man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, it says he humbled you and let you hunger. He allowed those desires, those temptations. He allowed those things. Do you see what I'm saying? Why? He fed you with manna that you did not know so that you would know that man does not live by bread alone, but kol motza fi Yahweh yichye ha'dam. He didn't say man lives by everything or every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. He said man lives by kol motza, everything that comes out of Yahweh's mouth. When Adam became a living soul, Yahweh breathed into his nostrils the breath of the spirit of life. Everything. See, the whole point of fasting is not about losing weight. It's not about, oh, look at my spiritual discipline. It's you're telling God, you are more to me than my necessary food. You are my food. You are my life. You are my substance. When you fast from desires, when you fast from those things that are tempting, what you're saying is, God, you are more to me than this carnal appetite. I don't live by every just word. I live by kol motza fi Yahweh yichye ha'adam. Everything that comes forth from your mouth. Because everything that comes out of the mouth of Yahweh Jesus is the will of God. There is nothing that emanates from Yahweh Jesus that is not his will. And the problem that we have is not about mental illness. It is not about clinical persuasions. The problem is we don't want everything that comes from the mouth of Yahweh God. We still want some of the things we want. So last week when I was saying that we had a communion coming up and I was vacillating between this week and next week and because I was trying to put it in with like, well, you know, man doesn't live by bread alone. Everything that comes forth from the mouth of God. And then I was trying to connect it to my food is to do the will of him so, and to finish his work. And God concluded by saying, we're going to end this series with communion because we need one more week to really ask ourselves, do we really want to do the will of God? And for those who say, I have no plan B, I have no other alternative, but I'm going to do the will of God, especially after the sermon that is going to conclude this series, then we'll take communion. I want to say something not to be harsh, not to be condemning. I, I want to say something as it relates to my faith in the communion. And even though I was going to kind of save this for the next series, I believe it's going to be 
very necessary to understand why I want people to really consider this. See, when you read the Gospels and Jesus speaks about what he did at the Passover Seder for communion. But when you read the epistles and Paul talking about communion, he says, uh, you're just going to, don't take this unworthily. Many are sick and have even died because they took this communion unworthily. So that's why we don't just do things just to be traditional or just to be religious. I want people to understand the severity of their commitment to the covenant of Yahweh Jesus. Because I'm telling you, if you think 2023 was crazy and you still have double-minded people that are still refusing to do Yahweh's will, you will not stand a chance when the grace is lifted and literally all hell breaks loose. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Do not be conformed to the image of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that by testing, you may discern what is the good and acceptable will of God. The reason why I made sure that you did not disconnect your mind from your heart and your heart from your soul and your soul from your spirit because what holds those things together in the kingdom of God is whether or not you still submit them to Yahweh's will. So when I pray, every day, and I get to the part of the prayer where I'm asking, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. And the Spirit of the Lord takes me into deeper intercession about Submitting myself to the execution to do Yahweh's will. Then as a shepherd, I get to the part of my prayer where I say, give me food to feed your sheep. Then I remind myself, the food is the will of God. So I pray, Lord Jesus, the only thing that I want you to give me to feed your sheep is your will. If it is not your will, then do not give it to me to feed your sheep. So sometimes that will are things you might not want to do. That is between you and him. My job is to make sure that I've given you the will of Yahweh Jesus. God has been gracious to all of us when we've been disobedient. God has been gracious to all of us when we don't properly execute his will. But God is not going to continue to let those who are called by his name mock his will and do exactly the opposite of what he wants them to do without consequences. Why? Because there are souls that need to be saved. And if we don't do his will, then we'll make disciples who don't do his will. 
So that may push people away. That may offend people. That may seem harsh. But I know in the integrity of my heart, I have begged Yahweh Jesus for his will. First, that I would do his will. Do not put anything in these sermons on my lips, any counsel that is not your will. Whether I do his will or whether you do his will, that's between me and him and you and him. But when it comes to what I will be judged for, did I tell you something that was not in this book and that did not line up with the will of Yahweh Jesus? You can criticize how I said it, whatever my tone is, but at the end of the day, the substance will be judged by whether or not was it the will of God. So next week's sermon, which will be the final sermon, will be the final conclusion on the issue of the mind, the series of the mind, but it will be locking in those who are ready and willing to do the will of God, whatever that means. So if you're going to participate, In the communion service next week, then this is what it means. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And that's why the final title of tonight's sermon is called Let's Eat. Note 6D, what does it mean to eat? Oh, it makes me feel good. Hold on. Yeshua was able to starve himself of physical food because he was filled with the spiritual food and steady diet of doing. Not saying he wanted to do it. Not saying putting lip service and false humility, but actually doing Yahweh's will. My food is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish his work, stand up on your feet with me, please. When you look at on our planet and you look at our world, you look at what's going on in the, in the communities of faith, you look at what's going on in, in the political world, I don't isolate this group and that group and this group and that group. I ask one question. Is that the will of God? Are there doing, when it comes to your finances, is this the will of God? When it comes to your sexuality, is this the will of God? When it comes to your relationships, is this the will of God? When it comes to your prayer life, is this the will of God? When it comes to your doctrine, is this the will of God? That is supposed to be the universal template. It's not, I do the will of God with this thing, but then this thing, or well, whatever. The collapse that's happening into our society is the confirmation of what happens when you don't do the will of Yahweh Jesus. It actually is that simple. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And listening, listening, Shema, obeying. Father, in Jesus' name, I'm asking, Father, that we would do your will and finish your work in Yeshua Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Women know when these cameras are off.